something positive. How many of you all work in a nonprofit right now? How many of you volunteer for a nonprofit? The second one, you should just raise your hand and pretend. That one was like, are you nice? <laughs> People are like, I was nice that one time. <laughs> So here's where my wife becomes extra understanding because I come home and I say, hey, I want to quit my job and start a nonprofit. Can we take some of our savings, put them in this 501c3 that I just founded? Uh, and then I started calling wealthy friends with this question, do you love America? And then the smarter among them said, what does it mean if I say yes to this question? And I said, at least $10,000. And then some of them said, I love America for that much. It's like, oh, good. So we raised a couple hundred thousand, grew to the millions. I spent the next seven years running this nonprofit venture for America that helped create several thousand jobs in the Midwest and the South primarily. Uh, and it was successful uh, to the level where we were honored by the Obama administration multiple times, so I got to bring my wife Evelyn to meet the president. My in-laws were very excited about me that week. <laughs> uh, but, during my seven years running Venture for America, I had this sinking feeling in so many communities that the water level was going down, not up. And that my work that was being celebrated was like pouring water into a bathtub that had a giant hole ripped in the bottom, and that water was rushing out the bottom of the hole. And then Donald Trump became our president in 2016. You all remember that night well. How did you react when you won? It's like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, oh. Um, sadness. Dismay. No one event here in New Hampshire, someone said bourbon. <laughs> so it, it was a tough night, and to me, it was not business as usual in the United States of America that tens of millions of us decided to take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star. And even if we reacted with sadness, we all have family members and friends and neighbors who were very excited about his victory. And so I started trying to figure out why he won, and sorting out all of these explanations that were offered every night essentially from 2016 to now. We've all seen the same stuff I have. Like, go ahead and shout out reasons we've been given as to why Donald Trump is our president today. Racism, Russia. Hillary. Hillary Rodham Clinton, yeah, she's not today. Income inequality. Income inequality. Immigrants. Immigrants. Politicians. Electoral college. Ignorance. Ignorance. <laughs> James Comey, the FBI, fake news, green, build the wall, the coal mine, the good old coal miners. <laughs> Sorry, there really aren't that many coal miners in this country anymore. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty good explanation. I think we got most of the big ones in there, right? Uh, so this has been mixed together into some kind of cocktail saying, here's why he's our president today. Uh, but I'm a numbers guy in Lebanon. I went looking through the numbers for an explanation, and I found one that I think many of you will find very compelling and familiar. Over the last number of years, we automated away, we eliminated four million manufacturing jobs in this country. And where were those jobs primarily located? Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Iowa, the swing states in the Midwest that Trump needed to win and did win. Uh, that's where most of these states were located. And there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial automation in a voting area and the movement towards Trump in that area. I've been to those towns, and you've been to those towns too. I know this in part because the same thing happened in New Hampshire a little while earlier. You all lost more than 12,000 manufacturing jobs, primarily in the northern part of the state. And after the Miller plant closed, then the shopping district closed, people left, the schools shrank, and that town has never recovered. When I've been up there to visit, they say very plainly, we're just managing the decline. Like we're just tracking how many people are leaving or dying in any given year. The same thing has played out in Missouri, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. I've seen those towns. I've seen them uh, over the last seven years. This is why I had this sinking feeling over the seven years I ran Venture for America, culminating in Donald Trump's victory in 2016. And now what's happening to those manufacturing jobs is shifting to other parts of the economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing around where you live here in New Hampshire? <coughs> and why are those stores closing? Amazon, that's right. 
Amazon's like a spaceship hovering over everything, sucking up $20 million in business every year, closing 30% of America's stores and malls. The most common job in our economy is retail clerk. The average retail clerk is a 39-year-old woman making between $8 and $12 an hour at that retail job. What is her next job going to be if the store clo closes? And someone said Amazon. <laughs> so, she could go to the fulfillment center and like, try to get a job there. Those, those fulfillment center jobs, number one, it's wall-to-wall -wall machines and robots, and then they're like people kind of interspersed between the robots. And then they put bracelets on the people to monitor your like packing time and activities, and if like you don't do enough in a particular period, it starts chirping at you. It's like, it's like some fitness bracelet from hell. <laughs> <laughs> But instead of being like, do more good stuff, it's like, you're lazy, stop going to the bathroom. Why are you so stuck? <laughs> Pretty much a waking nightmare against New Hampshire. No, that's what she's going to do. So, we're not really sure what her next job is going to be after the store mall closes. How much did Amazon pay in federal taxes last year? Yeah. That is the math, Lebanon. 20 billion out, 30% of stores closed, most common job disappears, and we get zero back. Now these are changes that we can see around us, but the changes are more widespread than most of us realize. When you all call the customer service line of a big company and you get the bot or software on the other end, I'm sure you do the same thing I do. When you press 000 and say human, human, representative, human, representative, until you get someone on the line. Raise your hand if that's what you do. Yeah, we all do that. That software is terrible. We're all like, a person still works at this company somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to find that person. Yeah, no, we're all there. But in two or three short years, the software is going to sound like this. Hello, Andrew, how are you? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, efficient. What will that mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making 10 to $14 an hour? Yeah, same thing as a retail clerk that lost her job. Same thing eventually as the truck drivers. How many of you all know a truck driver here in New Hampshire? It's the most common job in 29 states. Three and a half million truckers. 94% men, average age 49. My friends in California are working on robot trucks that can drive themselves. They tell me they're 98% of the way there. A robot truck just transported 20 tons of butter from California to Pennsylvania last month with no human intervention. Why did they choose butter for this maiden voyage? I have no idea. <laughs> But if you Google robot butter truck, <laughs> and then at the end of the route was a giant stack of pancakes. <laughs> I made up the pancakes, but everything else perfectly real. What will robot trucks mean for the three and a half million truck drivers, or the seven million plus Americans who work at truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truckers getting out and having a meal each day? They need UBI. Well, we need to do. We need to do something. And I'm a numbers guy, I went through these numbers and I was like, oh my gosh. Here's like the simplest way to think about it. This technology is getting smarter, more capable, more powerful all the time. And we are lucky to stay just about the same as human beings. Like if we don't get dumber on a given day, that's a pretty good thing. It's like, well, I can still find my keys, all right. We're still all right. I mean, not for some of the young people here, you all are getting smarter. The rest of us look at you enviously, being like, I remember getting smarter. <laughs> a long time since most of us got smarter. But the technology is getting way smarter and faster all the time. And, and you know, not all of it's stuff that you uh, like expect to displace a job. Just like when 30% of stores and malls mall close, you don't think, oh, that's a robot. Because it's not like the robot went behind the counter and started taking orders. But the robot, <laughs> it's like the Russians are upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. There's some teenage boys up there. Like, uh, you know, I went up there and, and um, threw some balls over the court. Ready? You got to kick out. So this fourth industrial revolution that we're in the midst of is going to be the most profound economic and technological transformation in the history of our country. And it's already happening. And that's before AI really comes out of the lab and starts doing a lot of work in earnest. Like, we're already seeing the impacts by the numbers. We worked out these four million manufacturing jobs. We're in the process of closing 30% of America's stores and malls. Here are the five most common job categories in the United States of America. Number one, administrative and clerical, which includes call centers. 
Number two, retail and sales. Number three, food service and food preparation. So that's like the self-serve kiosks with the McDonald's and whatnot. Number four is truck driving and transportation. And number five is manufacturing. Those five job categories comprise about half of all American jobs. For context, 33% of Americans graduated from college with a four-year degree. So the vast majority of Americans are doing jobs filled by high school grads because that's what most of us are. Now these five job categories are shrinking fast. And the recourse available for people when those jobs disappear is very, very low. Because 78% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. Almost half of us can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. So if you run into a rough patch, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go to to bah the Bahamas and reflect upon this setback. <laughs> like, that's not really the next move. It's more like, oh my gosh, well, like, what the heck am I going to do about next month's rent? Like, I can't miss work. And then you end up just lurching into some other opportunity to try and pay the bills, or you go into credit card debt and your stress levels mount. So here are the things that I was seeing in 2017. I went through the numbers and said, oh my gosh, we're scapegoating immigrants for problems immigrants have next to nothing to do with. If you go to a factory in Michigan, you do not find wall-to-wall -wall immigrants doing work. What do you find? Wall to wall giant robot arms and machines putting stuff together where there used to be people. So I went to our leaders in DC and I asked them, what are we going to do to help our people manage this transformation that is now ripping our communities apart? And what do you think the folks in DC said to me when I asked them, what are we going to do? <laughs> so, well, those are the right answers. That's what they said. Um, so, number one was nothing, or we can't talk about this. That was a nice quote. Number two, we should study this further. And then number three, the most popular, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future, AKA learn to code, right? And you've all heard some variant of that, but I looked at the studies, you all wanna guess how effective the government funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs in the Midwest? <laughs> zero, zero. I mean, you would guess very low, because you know it's low, because I'm anchoring you low. <laughs> But you also know it's low because you know human beings and your common sense. You know that if you have hundreds of manufacturing workers who lose their jobs, they don't all march outside and say, I'm here for my coding retraining program. <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for. Like, that my laptop. Like, that, that's not the way humans operate. The success rates of these programs were between 0 and 15%. They were total done. The reality is almost half of the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs in the Midwest left the workforce and did not work again. Of that group, almost half filed for disability. We then saw surges in suicides and drug overdoses in these communities to the point that America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row. You know the last time America's life expectancy declined three years in a row? It was the Spanish flu of 1918, a global pandemic that killed millions of people worldwide 100 years ago. You have to go back 100 years because it's highly unusual for life expectancy to go down in a developed country like the United States. Or it nearly goes up and up because we're getting richer, stronger, healthier. But here in the US, it went down and then down and then down again. So when I said this to the folks in DC, one person said something that sent me here to you all tonight. He said, Andrew, you are in the wrong town. No one here in DC will do anything about this because fundamentally, DC is a town of followers, not leaders. He said all this to me. It was tremendous. He said, he said, because fundamentally, this town is a town of followers, not leaders. And the only way we would do something about it is if you were to create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. And I said, challenge accepted.